All right, Luke chapter 14. If you need a Bible, there's two per row on the ends, so feel free to bend down and grab one. If you see somebody looking around, hand them one. Who's got their Bibles? Lift up your Bibles. Who's got them? hey there we go. I like it. Look at you guys, ready. I was so encouraged. Was it, a, was it uh, two weeks ago, I think, right, where we kind of dug into those questions and uh, I was playing, you know, devil's advocate, sort of. Uh, but it was so, I was blessed to hear your, your faith rooted in scripture, rooted in verses, your, your reasoning, your scriptural reasoning, all of that was good. So just, I just, just, I love you guys. It's, it's good to see that. So keep it up. Um, let me get some water real quick here. I can take it in. We will do a Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, of course, that's the number there. If I have this mic here, okay, I've got a microphone. What steps are there to help this mic work? A cord. I need a cord to make this work. Okay. Yeah. What else? It needs to go into the outlet. Very good. There we go. Uh-huh. What else? We need a speaker. Is it working? No, because it's muted. We need a sound guy. What, Cody? Electricity. Yes. You got to speak into it, right? I need an actual speaker that actually speaks, right? Do you see all the steps? Right? There's no brainer, and I know it's kind of a silly illustration, but in the same way that there are steps to get things connected and working and functional, there are steps for us to be connected this way to God. And there can be disconnects that happen between us and God as well, things that sever that connection. And if we spend too much time in this state, what happens? Yeah, <laughs> you make it a personal. You go, he's like, you go fishing too much. You occupy your time with other things. Maybe sin even creeps in. Maybe think wrong thinking creeps in. Wrong believing creeps in. Wrong speaking. Wrong acting. All of those things get connect. Or get get. Uh, happen when you get disconnected. That's why God gives us a recipe for staying connected, getting connected, and staying connected to him. And we're going to take a look at that here today. Luke chapter 14. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus is in his full-time ministry, rolling around with his disciples. Verse 1, 14 says this. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Um, that is, I think, edema. We call it edema now, just to let you know. I don't think dropsy is used anymore, I don't think. <laughs> There's people in the medical profession, I don't know. But uh, edema. So it's, it's an excess buildup of fluid. Uh, that's, that's what it is. So he was at this dinner party. Behold, there's a certain man before him who had edema, well, I'll say. Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him, the, the, the man with edema, and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. And they could not answer him regarding these things. So Jesus is out and about. 
and he probably was invited to dinner. That's not uncommon, especially culturally. That's what it was. And this, this particular person that invited him was a ruler of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees already were like the, the, the cream of the crop religious authorities. And this is a ruler of them. Kind of a big deal. It's kind of like getting invited over to like the mayor's house or something like that, right? It's like, oh, cool, right? This is kind of a neat thing, all right? Probably a nice meal too, right? Probably has some decent cash, you know? Uh, and so there's probably all the fixings out. It's a feast, man. And so that's what's going on. But then he gets there, he gets there, and all of a sudden there's this random guy with edema. This is a setup, guys. Do you smell it? Do you smell the setup here? They're like, we'll invite him over on the Sabbath. We'll have Joseph come over. You know, he's got that condition. We know that Jesus wants to be healed on the Sabbath. And we're trying, remember, this whole time, what are they trying to do? They're trying to trap him to, so they can accuse him and defame him. Don't follow this guy. Don't find that Jesus is a phony. He breaks the law. He heals on Sabbaths, right? He's already he addressed that last, uh, last week. Last week to us, <laughs> uh, chapter 13, we talked about that too, right? Um, so here they are, he, again, dinner, dinner time, all of a sudden. Did you notice here that it says um, he answered them? It's like it doesn't, say, it doesn't list a question there. That means there was little, probably little murmurings. Is he going to do it again? Is he going to again? Yeah, why does he want to do it again? Because remember, this, there'd be a long table. They don't sit at tables like we do, right? It would, you would, it was a, there were low tables, and you would lay down, and you would have, I forget which one, I think it's your left side, you lay on your left side predominantly, right? And so you would, and then you would eat with your right. So you'd be laying feet out from the table, right? So all, picture that what's going on. So it's com, com, conversational. Everybody's having like, tables weren't part of the culture yet there. Um, so, by the way, the, the whole Last Supper thing, that table, <laughs> yeah, it's not a, it's a cool picture, but that's not the way it looked. And plus, they weren't all sitting on one side of the table, even if there was a table. Um, anyway, who does that, right? Um, all that to say is, okay, so that's, that's kind of the environment there. And there's this guy with, the, with edema. He's got this massive flu. Like, he's, like, it's Pharisees. This is what I picture. It's Pharisees, Jesus, and then, like, the, like the guy who has a noticeable, like, issue. It's totally a setup, right? This is 100% a setup. And so Jesus is, like, answering. He's like, hey, look, you know, is it, is it lawful? He springs the trap, right? Jesus springs the trap. He points out he, their, their incongruency, their hypocrisy, doesn't he? He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And then I like, because they're like kind of shamed already. Like they're awkward. Like, I don't want to answer because he's going to make us look stupid again. <laughs> right? So they're just like silent, right? Um, he points out, though, this, this analogy. He goes, if you have a donkey, an animal that falls into a pit, verse 5, right? It's one of you, no matter what day of the week it is, wouldn't go and take that donkey and get him out of there. That's a fair assessment, right? And Jesus is like, or is that work, guys? No, every single one of you, I'm paraphrasing now, every single one of you around this table, you know if you had one of your animals fall into a little pit or a hole or something and it got messed up, you'd go and help the creature and bring it out. And that's an animal. That's an animal. Here's a man who's been afflicted who gives a crap that it's a Saturday. Good is good. Right? Church, we need to make sure that our religion doesn't get in the way of the spirit. Hear me out on that. I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't give us strict parameters. It does. Bible is our plumb line to know what is approved, what is not approved. But what happened was the Pharisees uplifted the Sabbath day and they started adding, you can't do these things. You know, it's like, it's not work to heal somebody. That's a blessing. It's always good to do good, <laughs> right? To help so you leave the animal or the pit in a pit? No. Well, then why would you leave a person who's wounded? You know, and or needs healing. That's what is. That's what he's saying here. So there's this whole setup, and he springs the trap. Right? The Pharisees' religious protocol prevented them from connecting to God. That's my. That's my my point here that I wanted to say. So to um, 
yeah, we're going to be talking about connecting God. Um, So to connect to God, you have to be open. See, they were closed off. The Pharisees were closed off, weren't they? They they weren't looking (laughs) to connect to God through Jesus Christ. They weren't looking to do that. They weren't open to him being the Messiah, God in the flesh. They were not open to that. They were looking for ways to disprove that and to come against him. They wanted others to, they wanted to defame him. They wanted to tell him Jesus is not God. He's not what you think he is. He's not the savior. He's not the one who, he's not Emmanuel, God with us. He's not any of those things. And they were closed off. Church, if you want to connect to God, you need to be the opposite of that. Instead of closed off to those things, you need to be what? What? Open. Open. We need to be open. Okay? We do. We have to be open to God moving. Now, you don't want to obviously let anything in. We're not talking about that. You don't want to have your mind so open. You know, be, oh, so be, be more open-minded, man. And it's like, okay, there's also a lot of verses to guide what's God and what isn't. I get that. But we also don't want to become so rigid and closed-minded that we can't even see God move, man. So to connect to God, you really want to connect to God, you got to be open to the fact that he's going to connect with you. And sometimes when he connects with you, church, hear this, Christian, when he starts to connect with you and he starts to stir in you, and then he may be drawing. I say he probably will be, Drew, you'd say this before, he will bring you to a place of uncomfortable. (laughs) Colleen, were you nervous about coming up here today? Yeah, you're supposed to (laughs) Sam, you're nervous about next week or, or two weeks from now, right? Yeah, you know, not to put you on the spot, you know. Call, you just had something happen, the Holy Spirit speaking to you and giving you some direction. It's like this, uh, are we open to that, though? Can, is that okay? Can God speak? Is that okay? Can he do that? <laughs> we want it. <laughs> we say, we're yours, it's yours. And then he starts to speak. Like, whoa, whoa, hold on. You put him in a box. That's more manageable. That's more manageable. I can just, I can get that out when I want it. I mean, you know. No, no, no. We're his. We're his, not the other way around. We need to be open to him moving. If you want to be connected, if you want to be connected with him, if you don't want to be connected, then just close yourself off and you can just live your life that way. All right, verse seven. So he told a parable to those who were invited. So Jesus goes into this story, still at the, still at the dinner table. Uh, yeah, it's a solar table. It's a slow table. <laughs> it's a low one. Uh, he told the parable to those who were invited uh, when he noted how they chose the best places. Um, he's talking about the, those who sat around the table. So just, just to give up, let me give you a backdrop here. Um, when, so culturally, breaking bread together was a was a com- like a common thing, and you wouldn't just have your family. You'd have friends and 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 relatives, and it'd be extended. And it's, it was a whole thing, right? And, uh, and when you invited people, there were certain places around that table that were more um, prevalent. Like we typically have like the head of the table, right? Like so it'd be like the end, which is a rectangle, like boom, right? So there was, there was a place of honor and, and, uh, uh, and then there was a place that was lesser around these, these eating tables, right? And so that's kind of what was going on here. So Jesus is noticing uh, who's sitting where and how people, some people just went straight to the prominent place, right? They kind of, they, they kind of as people were gathering, and then there was like a, a mad rush to be first, you see? Kind of like when the, at amusement park, right? Kids, like the amusement park, open, like maybe the ride was shut down and it reopens, and as soon as you see that it reopens and there's no line, what do you want to do? So you're like, whoa, we're running. Yeah, we're running to get to the line, man. Like, let's go. You book it, right? And you're like almost like running into people, right? Not, not, not any of kids here. You would be very respectful of elders and other kids. I know that. Compose, self-control, fruits of the spirit. Um, but we, in the same way, there's like a place of honor, and then there you are. Sit, how, we're kind of, we're kind of silly as humans, aren't we? Like thinking like we're awesome because we're sitting in a better place and around a table. <laughs> so stupid. Anyway, um, Jesus notices this. Okay, that's the backdrop. Verse seven. So he, he he notes that they chose the best places. So he says this parable to them. Verse eight. When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, don't sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. 
So someone else shows up that's more invited, and they go, hey, man, you need to scoot over let this guy in. That's embarrassing, right? It's like, ooh. <laughs> so he's saying, don't do that. And he who invited you uh, and, and him come to, and say to you, give place to this man, and then you begin with, with shame to take the lowest place. They knock you down the, the, the totem pole there, so to speak. But when you are invited, instead do this. Go and sit down in the what place? Lowest place. So that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, hey, friend, go up higher. That's more honorable, isn't it? Hey, come, come on. Hey, you know what? Come on up, up here. Versus, hey, scooch over. We got a, uh, you know, Bill showed up. <laughs> Then you will have glory in the presence of all those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be, what? Exalted. Verse 12. Then he also said to them who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you must be repaid. Don't, don't just invite people over because you want to get you want to get invited over to their house. You know, and don't don't see it as a oh, I did it for you. Now, you know, you got to reciprocate. Come on, man. And if you don't, then pff, well, you gotta come over to my house. You know? he's, like, he's like, don't don't be that way. Um, but verse 13, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Here's why. You will be blessed because they can't repay you. But you're going to repaid, be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Right? Remember we talked about storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He's saying, like, look, hey, you go do something for them because you hope that they do something for you. Well, that's your reward. Versus storing up for yourself treasure in heaven that you do something for someone who's not going to repay you or can't repay you. Right? That's storing up treasures in heaven. So Jesus uses this situation to address a more important topic than just merely healing on Saturdays. Uh, that was one of the things he talked about. And the topic that he's bringing up is pride. He's bringing up the topic of pride. I'm somebody, and I need to sit on the nicest part of the table, the head of the table, as a matter of fact. I think I deserve that, right? And, you know, we always think, we might think other people struggle with pride, not you, right? We have that, though. We have an element of pride somewhere. Why do we get offended when someone, like, pulls in front of us in a car, like, you know, or they, they're driving too slow? <laughs> it's probably an element of pride in there. Like, who, who says your pace is the right pace? I'm speaking to myself. Don't worry. Like, if anybody's seen how I drive. But, like, you know, like, you know what? We need to be less prideful. Anyway. So he uses the situation to address a more important topic than just healing on Saturdays, which he's already talked about. And he talks about pride. It, again, we talked about the, sit, the seating arrangements. Um, they would sit in order of prestige or honor. If you think of Joseph, remember Joseph uh, when he was um, the like number two in all of Egypt, and he sat his brothers in, in order. And, like, and they're like, how does he know like where to put us? Like, because age would be a factor. So you would give more honor to the older person. The elderly would get more a place of honor. That type of a thing. Um, Anyway, so these proud people showing up to the, and this is what the, was happening amongst this crew, this group, they were, they were showing up and pridefully picking the, the nicer spots. Jesus notices this right away. He's like, I see what's going on here. Not only is this a setup, but you guys have a lot of pride, man. So he, he addresses this, okay? And he, he says, hey, look, you should be humble. If you humble yourself, you will be exalted. Exalted, for the kids in here, maybe, exalted means lifted up. Lifted up, like pumped up. High fives. <laughs> Humbled is go stand in the corner. <laughs> right? So that's, that's it. He's like, hey, look, if you were prideful, God's going to say, go stand in the corner. You get rid of that. You don't need that junk. But if you're humble, he's like, hey, high five, come here. Love it. Good job. Right? That's kind of the same concept with us and the Lord. Because pride will prevent you from connecting with God. So we're going to talk about things that prevent and the things that 
allow you to connect with God. And so we've already talked about how uh, being closed off, closed-minded, closed off to the Lord. Well, obviously that's a disconnect, right? So we need to be open. This is this one here. We need to be humble. So if you want to connect with God, church, you need to be humble. Guess what? Here's another verse that popped in my brain. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's say it again. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So I'm not great at grammar and literature necessarily, but it seems to me that we should be humble if we want to be connected with him because the last thing I want is God to resist me. I don't want God to resist me. I want God to say, yeah, come on here. I'm all ears. What's up? What's up? Guess what, church? Pride will get you. Pride will disconnect you. So stay humble. Amen? Verse 15, continuing on. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with them heard these things, remember, this is, this is a dinner conversation. He breaks out into a story. He sprung the trap, gave a parable, which kind of dissed them, didn't it? He's their guest. <laughs> Jesus will be real. Anyway, one of those who sat at the table with them heard these things and said, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. My, <laughs> what? My guest, this is me. I think there was an awkward moment after Jesus told that parable because he noticed the pride and he called it out. And he called it out like face to face. They're all eating dinner. It was like someone bringing up, you know what? And they talk, talk about politics at the dinner table. <laughs> like, Trump is awesome. <laughs> just is, so, right? You know, it's like, oh, Biden's an idiot. <laughs> you know, whatever that is. It's just like this, this tension, right, at, at the dinner table. I think that happened. I don't know that it was that inflamed, but Jesus started talking about it. He's like, hey, you need to, be, you, you need to not uh, be prideful in, in how you sit around a table. That's a, that's a big deal, bigger than healing on a Sabbath. And that's like eye to eye. It's who invite, he was eating dinner with, right? So I think there's this awkward moment in like some random dude, not random, he was out there too. He's like, ah, uh, blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. <laughs> it's just kind of like topic change, right? He's like, come on, guys, can we all get along? You know, kind of type thing. That's my read on this, you know, whatever. So verse 16, though, uh, continues here. It says, blessed is he who eats bread in the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus said to him, he goes, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. So now he kind of just does a topic change-ish. He sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all the things are now ready. But they all with one accord came, uh, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I, I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I just married a wife. I can't come. So again, here's a, let's set the stage in your minds, okay? There's a guy, he's wanting to throw a feast, and he's inviting people. He's got hand invitations to these people. He's like, hey, go, servant, go, go pass these out. Go invite them. I, I can't, can't wait for, you know, for, for you know, Tracy to come and Bill to come and all these. Uh, I can't wait for it. Go tell them. And then all of a sudden, these excuses. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm busy. Da, 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 da. I need to pray about it. <laughs> That's another way we say no, right, as Christians. Right? I need to pray about that. <laughs> say no. Anyway, all right. So he's, it's like, what the heck? Verse 21, the servant comes back and reported these things to the master, then passed through the house, being angry. Like, hey, I hand invited these people. I wrote invitations out and had you go seek them out, and now they're not going to come. You're, you're going to reject me? Said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. He's like, hey, go down the alleys. Go down the side streets, right? Bring in the average Joe, okay? He says, let that happen. Verse 22, the master says, uh, the servant said, master, it is done as you commanded, and there's still room. So it sounds like some of those people responded in this parable, right? So he went out and started to invite the poor, the maimed, the blind, all that stuff. The, the average people, they started coming, right? He's like, hey, there's still room. Verse 23, the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. 
Now he says, hey, go out into the interstates and, and the, you know, the, you, every, every city has like those, you know, at the interstates, you'll have some homeless people that gather underneath the, the, the bypasses and stuff like that, or the, the, there'll be like a, a, a stream or something, there'll be some like, like foliage and down in there, and they'll set up tents down, almost every city has that. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, hey, go find those people who are just on the outskirts and they're destitute, bring them into. You know what? Those handwritten invitations to the specific, they're rejecting me, go to those people. You know what? Okay, not enough. We still got more. Go out to every, basically, go to everybody. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. He's talking about the first group. This is a picture of how Jesus is inviting the Jews first to come to his kingdom and to be part of it. And that by and large, they have been rejecting and making excuses that Jesus is not the Messiah. They're even finding stumbling blocks with healing on the Sabbath, right? These kinds of things. They are finding excuses to not go there. That's what we're seeing. So Jesus goes out into the streets and the alleys and finds us. <laughs> right? He finds a guy like me. You know, he goes out in the highways and the byways and the hedges down in the, you know, in the gutter. <laughs> and he finds a guy like me. I'm glad he invited it. Aren't you? Everyone was invited. The initial VIP list rejected. So he goes to a secondary list. Some came. The obscure and rejected list, seemingly more of these people responded. I just see here, though, those excuses. Ah, those excuses were disconnecting them, weren't they? They were invited. Again, this is symbolic of God bring, wanting to bring them into the kingdom of heaven. Salvation we're talking about. And they had excuses. I had excuses for not saying yes to Jesus for many years. I was talking with somebody online this, this last week. I don't know if you guys follow some of the stuff on, on Facebook. There was a, a, a reel, I think, or maybe it was one of my sermons that were on our, our Facebook page. And somebody was just like, ah, was just, you know, Jesus wasn't real. And I'm like, sure he was. I go, there's tons of evidence that he existed. He's like, what? I was like, if I shared with you and you see that Christianity is true, would you become a Christian? You heard me say that a couple weeks ago, right? Oh, sure, why not? Prove it. So I listed, blah, 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 and I'm like, okay, that's too much. And I turned it down. And I'm like, here you go. I, let me know if you need more. And he, did, he had another excuse, and another excuse. I said, based, I, I, I forget his name at this point. I said, his name is Jonathan. I said, hey, at this point, uh, you're not open. You're not open, and you're just making excuses. These are just excuses, as if they, that's, oh. nope, nope. Well, they're not pursuing truth, right? These same people here in this parable have excuses, and people have excuses all around why they don't want to be obedient to God, why they don't do this, why they don't do that. Oh, well, that's just the way I am. That's how God made me. Or if he, would, if he were real, he would do this, and he hasn't done that, so I guess he's not, we have these excuses for not following. That shouldn't be the way, right? Um, the call of God goes out to all people, but it's often the down and out people that respond the best. It's the people that go, ah, good. That's usually the people that are the hardest to win to the kingdom because they go, who cares, whatever. So if you, if you want to connect with God, you need to be willing to respond to his call. You have to be willing to respond to his call. His call goes out. You, you felt it last week. You felt the call. You responded to the call. Praise the Lord. And if we want to be connected with him, when that call comes out to you, you need to respond. Yes, Lord. Right? A yes, Lord. A surrender. Whether that be salvation, whether it be coming back to him, whether that be going and sharing, whether that be uh, coming up coming up on stage and sharing something, or whether it be reaching out or praying for somebody. And, and, and so, but we, if we're really wanting to connect with God, we got to be willing to respond to the call, no matter if it's, if it's comfortable or not. 
and oftentimes it's not super comfortable because it causes you to be stretched. You know, is that okay? But if you really want to connect with God, you need to respond to his call. Verse 25. Now, great multitudes went with Jesus. Okay, dinner's over, right, <laughs> at this point. And then I, I bet you some of these people were leaving the, the dinner party going, man, inviting him, it's just a, he's a loose cannon. Like, you just never know what you're going to get. We have a rule. You don't talk about those things at the dinner table. Jeez. <laughs> he set off a grenade. It's good. Uh, verse 25. Now, when multitudes went with him, now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be, be my disciple? Whoa. Hate your wife? Hate your husband? Hate your kids? Hate your parents? Hate yourself? That's not our culture's message, is it? Love yourself. <laughs> What's he really saying? Is, is he saying, hey, you need to, you need to, you need to slap, slap people around. You need to yell at other people. Hate them, hate them. It's a comparative statement. It's a comparative statement. Let's continue on. It'll make more sense as we read the rest of it, as often is the case with the word. It says he can't be my disciple if he doesn't hate those things. Whoever does not bear his cross, cross is a place of suffering, right? A place of shame. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, make fun of him, saying, hey, this man began to build, he wasn't able to finish. What king going to make war against another king doesn't sit down first and consider whether he's able uh, with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? So picture an army of 20,000, you've got 10,000. Like, mm, are we better fighters? Are we, can we take them out two to one? I don't know. It's like saying that that's, a, that's counting the cost. He says, or else, the others, or else while the other is still a great way off, he's going to send a delegation and ask conditions for peace. You'll make peace if you can't think you can win. So likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus ties it up in the end. For us who are a little slower, which is okay, he says, hey, if you aren't willing to sacrifice these other things for gaining the kingdom, if you're not willing to do that, you can't be my disciple. If you're not, if you do not forsake all you have, you cannot be my disciple, okay? Being a disciple of Jesus means being willing to forsake everything else. If all you had was Jesus and all your other relationships are gone, they've been destroyed with who knows what, life, sin, circumstances, whatever, and all you had left was Jesus, would you be okay? It's a tough thing, but would you be okay? I like that. Good. Because therein lies... Our character, our, our character, our, our uh, sense of self-worth is actually found when we forsake all for him, which is interesting. Now, God, may, God wants you to have a blessed marriage. God wants you to have a blessed family and kids and parents and, and all of these things. He, that's why the Bible talks about all that stuff. But comparatively, compared to finding Christ, it's like, you want to be my disciple? You need to count those things as, for, see them in the accurate view as, as, as they are. Okay? And it, it talks also about counting the cost. There's a cost of following God. Right? Your eyes are going to be opened. Your mind's going to shift and change as you, as you stay connected with God. And when that happens, the world's going to get more and more frustrating. Right? It's going to get more and more frustrating because it's broken. You see the brokenness. How many times you turn on the news or this or that, and you hear this happened, that happened, and this person did this, and, what, and you're just like, when does it stop? 
broken and you see it and you know what should happen or you know what someone else should be doing and they're not doing it. You're like, what the heck? Urgh. How could you? Oh, that's right, because your eyes are open now. It's tough. It's tough to follow Jesus. It's tough being a disciple. That's what it is. A disciple is following Jesus, right? It's tough. It's saying count the cost. You better count that cost. No matter what, I'm following you. No matter what happens with all these relationships, my, my bank account, uh, my friendships, my family, my home, no matter what, I am yours, Lord. Right? Jesus isn't saying that you must hate, like, but it's compared to being devoted to him in that comparison, that comparative statement, it's as though we hate because of how much love and devotion and attention and sacrifice we're willing to do for the Lord. That's what we're talking about. Ironically, when we have that right perspective, now all those other areas actually are going to be more blessed. It's when we idolize those other relationships that can cause problems. You idolize your spouse. You idolize your kids. I'm telling you. You start to lift them up on a pedestal. It's out of whack, man. Jesus first. God first. And you must be willing to take action or forsake anything that gets in the way because God is greater. So to connect with God, uh, you have to be fully devoted, fully dedicated to him. You really want to connect with God? You need to be fully dedicated. No, you know, your, your ambitions, your dreams, your relationships, your family. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have those things. Um, it's just where the place of those things are in comparison to where Jesus is in your life. All right, verse 34 and 35, and we'll be done. Jesus wraps it up here and says, salt is good. It seems like a topic change here. Also, now he's talking about seasonings. <laughs> salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. Dunghill, that's like poop pile, okay? It's neither fit for the land nor fit for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Remember, anytime he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, that means if you get it, you get it. <laughs> so think on it, right? He gave it, he just gave it, and you look at this placement of this, it's like, why did he do that? He wraps up this message by talking about salt. <laughs> salt, church, does what? You add some salt to some food. What is it doing? It seasons it. It brings, it can bring out the, flavor, right? It brings out the flavor in something. And then somebody else said it over here. Preserves. There's a preservative aspect. If you salt something, it can keep longer, right? Okay? So salt has twofold. It, can, it brings flavor, it enriches, and it preserves. And then Jesus says, the salt, da, da, da. You all right? right? If salt can no longer do those things, Qualities. If you've got some salt, if you're tasting some sauce, you're making some spaghetti sauce, right? You guys getting hungry now? I love talking about food right about now. It's fantastic. Right at lunchtime, you guys are killing me, man. Making some sauce. It sm oh, smells good. You taste it. And it's like, it just needs something, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, it just needs a little something there. Usually, salt or garlic if you're like our house, right? You know? Or it's garlic salt, <laughs> right? That's an actual thing. So you put some salt in it. You're like, you mix that up, let that get in there and permeate. And that, ah, there it is. Now, what if you had that same sauce going and you put the salt in it and nothing changed? What the? What are you going to do with the salt? You're going to throw it away. It's worthless. This is worthless to me. It is not doing what it's designed to do, what it's supposed to do. So I'm going to throw it in the trash. Or you're going to preserve some meat. You're going to salt this thing. You're going to salt this up, right? Boom, boom, boom. We're going to store it, pack it in the salt, you know, put it in the refrigerator, and that's going to keep for you. And you get, then you go to get that out. Oh, my gosh, it's rotten. How is it rotten? I packed it right. What are you going to do with that salt? Throw it away. It's, not, it's no good. It's no good. There's no use for it. It's not even good to throw in manure. 
It's, it's completely worthless. It's going to be cast out and rejected. Jesus is saying, he's implying, don't lose your flavor. Don't lose your preservative qualities for what is good. Otherwise, your faith is worthless. So if you're wanting to be connected with God, you've got to understand that there's a cost. There's a cost to not connecting with him. If you go and all of a sudden you stay, you, going back to my analogy of the micro, microphone, you, just dis, you decide to disconnect. There's a cost. We talked about that. And here's what happens. And using Jesus' illustration, he's like, it's like salt that loses its flavor. It's like salt that loses its pres preservative qualities. And I've known some Christians who've started off strong with the Lord, and then they disconnect themselves with God, and they lose their flavor. They've lost their light. Their light has dimmed. They aren't, they aren't a blessing to other people. They're a curse to other people. And there's compromise and pain and sorrow in their wake. In, in surrounding their lives. That's what happens. There's a cost to not connect with God. You don't have to do it. He's not going to force it on you. But, no, but you better count the cost. Count the cost to follow him and also count the cost to not follow him. Because there's a cost with that too. When you say no to Jesus, there's a cost in that and it's far greater. Rena. Say again. Ooh, yeah. Hmm. I don't know how to tie that in. Though. <laughs> Salt's meant to be a positive thing in this. In this. In this. Uh, it's not even. It's not even. It has no purpose. Yeah, it can't even do that. Yeah. What's that, Drew? Killing, destroying. Oh, it becomes volatile. Okay, yeah. It's only harmful. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's some toxic. There's been some Christians that have been some bad examples, huh? We probably all know know them, right? Maybe it was you at one point. Maybe it was me at one point, because it was. For years, I backslid. I was not a good example. I was a toxic Christian, we could say. You know, I was losing my salt. You know, and then until the Lord said, you need to change or I'm done with you. I'm back. I'm back, Lord. I'm back. And I've been back ever since. Amen. Kayla. It purifies. Yeah, it's true. It disinfects. Yeah, that's a good point. So a couple action steps here, guys, and then we'll do Q&A. So if you've got questions, well, I'll answer the questions here. Um, if you're wanting to connect with God, okay, if that's you, that's your heart, and you're saying, hey, I want to connect with God, let's do this thing, creator of the universe, pretty cool. He wants to connect with you, by the way, pretty cool. You need to stay open to him. You need to be open to it. Hey, I want to connect. Well, you should be open to the fact that he's going to speak to you. He's going to want to talk to you. He may ask you to do something. He may ask you to, he may bring you to a place that's a little bit less comfortable, and that's okay. Just be open to that. So you want to connect with him? Be open, not closed off, be open. Next, stay humble. You do not have it all figured out. You don't. I don't, okay? We don't, we're just trying to get through this life, aren't we? It's, it's like if you're, if you're either in a trial, coming out of one, or getting ready to go into one, we feel like. <laughs> That's just kind of what it is, right? And so like, let that keep you humble. <laughs> it's like you need the Lord constantly. Stay humble. Don't get prideful. When something starts to go right, don't get prideful like you did something. It's the Lord. Give credit where credit's due. Stay humble. Okay, so stay open, stay humble. Be responsive to his call if you want us to connect with him. When he starts to guide you and, and speak out, respond. Be bold. Respond. Respond to that. Here I am, Lord. Let's do that. Let's do this thing. Don't reject. Don't make excuses. Oh, I'll do that tomorrow. It's not that big deal to miss this week. Oh, it's not a big deal to not read my Bible. I can't. We got all kinds of excuses. There are so many excuses. <laughs> it's a disconnect from God. I get it. Don't accept excuses. Don't do it. And then lastly, to connect with God, you need to be fully dedicated. 
Not halfway dedicated, fully dedicated. You do. Like, do you want just enough of Jesus to make you miserable? <laughs> Meaning, like, you got just enough of Jesus that you're like, oh, I know right and wrong, and I shouldn't be doing it, but I don't want to do those things. Uh, and there's a lot of Christians that have that. And then they feel bad because they watched this, they looked at that, they drank this, they smoked this, or whatever that is, and they've got one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world, and they are not comfortable. It's like sitting on a fence. That's not comfortable. Picture a picket fence. <laughs> really not comfortable to sit on that. <laughs> right? Pick a side. What did Jesus say in uh, Revelation, Daniel? He said, I would rather that you were hot or cold. Right? It's like lukewarm. Makes you want to puke. That's what he says. Anyway, be fully dedicated, not divided. Decide. You know what? I'm not perfect, but I'm going to move closer and closer every day. Okay? Doesn't mean you immediately become perfect and now you make all the right decisions and everything's good and, you know, beautiful. No, but it does mean that day by day you're going the right direction. Oh, whoops. Okay, go in the right direction. And that a year from now you should look different. Two years from now, you should look different in a good, in a good way, <laughs> right? And you look back 10 years, 20 years. Wow, I've come a long way. And your kids are part of that legacy and all that good stuff, right? Be fully dedicated if you want to connect with God. A, good, a few good habits and then we're done. Um, pray. You've heard me say all these. But I want to bring them to the front of your mind because these are your cornerstones, Right? You have, to, you have to always practice your basics. The basics never go away. Good habits. Pray daily. Read your Bible daily. Be in fellowship daily. Serve daily. Be in fellowship daily. I don't want to be in fellowship daily. Hit somebody up. Hey, praying for you. Hey, check it in on you. How you doing? Use the app. <laughs> Thank you. Right? You know, I just, that person's on my mind. Maybe God put them on your mind. And you need to reach out. And say, hey, encouraging message, just let you know I'm praying for you today. Or how can I pray for you today? Why not? Good habits. Pray daily. Read your Bible daily. Fellowship daily. Serve daily. It's practical things. Practical things, right? And then the, the, those, those first ones about connecting with God, they all have to deal with the heart. It all has to do with your heart and mindset. Open, humble, responsive, fully dedicated.